Well, thank you, Ev, for that grand introduction. I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of pressure now, so uh, uh, hopefully this will um, interest you. We've been uh, looking at uh, approaches to supporting providers in communicating with parents who hesitate or decline to vaccinate. And uh, so the, the presentation I'm giving you, to you today is describing an intervention that's still in the process of being developed and uh, it's informed by a lot of evidence. We've tried to capture a lot of the knowledge and research that's out there uh, in developing our intervention, but we haven't yet trialled it. So uh, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. I'm working with a, a large team of people, uh, an eminent advisory group, and along the way through this journey of developing this intervention, there have been uh, numerous contributors and particularly like to acknowledge people here, including Kath Jackson, Helen Bedford, Nix of Dallas, and the team that we have at the moment, uh, you see listed there. Nina Berry uh, and Penn Robinson work closely with me on this project at the University of Sydney. Our funding is from the Department of Health um, in the Australian Government through the National Centre for Immunisation Research. So we start with this assumption. We've described this simple spectrum on vaccine acceptance. It's far from perfect, but it's a useful workable definition, starting with people who accept right through to people who decline. We sometimes call them refusers. Um, that language is not particularly acceptable to parents who don't vaccinate, so we're trying to speak the language that's acceptable to them because we want to reach them with this intervention as well. On the very edge of declining, I would say you've got some anti-vaccination activists. But I'm not talking about anti-vaccination activists here. I'm talking about parents who don't want to vaccinate at all. And what the research tells us, tells us a few things about these groups, but the people at that right end of the spectrum have a set of concerns about vaccination that have been well defined in the literature, starting with research that Bruce did many years ago uh, that uh, has been built upon. But we get this um, story, if you like, that parents are worried about the ingredients. They're worried about the recipe in vaccines. They're worried about children, very young, being given too many. Um, and they're worried about the impact that may have on the immune system. And of course, then there's specific vaccines like MMR or Hep B and so forth, depending on the country. So these are some of the concerns held by between um, 21 to 25 per cent, according to a survey that we did in Australia a couple of years ago. And that same survey also told us a common story that we know that health professionals are influential when it comes to vaccination, and they are also a prominent source of information. So the grey bars represent source, the numbers at the top represent a a perceived influence score out of 10. And you see in our study, GPs and family doctors were right up there. So how should providers communicate, given that they're so important? There's some really interesting research that was presented here a couple of years ago at Annecy by Doug Opel that suggests that it's actually better to use a presumptive strategy. Well, you have to get some shots. Um, as opposed to a more participatory communication strategy, which they, that was their, their definition. Um, uh, instances like, what do you want to do about um, vaccines? And they found that that participatory initiation of the conversation between a provider and a parent was associated with a 17-fold um, odds of the parent indicating that they wouldn't vaccinate. So this was an issue. And then some further work by Jennifer Moss with Noel Brewer um, with HPV with adolescent vaccination found, of course, that a recommendation was strongly associated with higher uptake and that paternalistic communication was associated with higher uptake of um, men's C and HPV vaccine. Um, they called it paternalistic ex um, communication. Um, but in the actual um, study, they gave it the label um, uh, physician-directed. Um, so they called it efficient. 
So that, you know, that sort of more directive approach is the efficient communication. And they showed that that was associated with higher uptake, and, but it was uh, much less common. And this is in relation to adolescent vaccines. So you can see the sort of story that's being built here, but when you look at what parents say they want, they want valid consent, they want the chance to ask questions, but they lack confidence, as shown by Kath and colleagues in a systematic review. Um, Katrina Brown, Nix of Dallas and others found in their systematic review that lower uptake was linked to a perception that the discussion with health professionals about immunisation was inadequate in length, depth, dismissive and difficult. In, uh, in, we certainly know that a presumptive or paternalistic style um, when someone's very hesitant is highly unlikely to work and it may backfire. It will certainly backfire with decliners. Some anti-vaccine activists in my research on the anti-vaccine movement in the late 90s, I saw them in their narratives about why they became activists talk about pivotal, horrible experiences with providers around vaccination when they were vaccinating. And interestingly, um, a follow-up study by Opel and colleagues found that participatory initiation formats were associated with increased odds of a highly rated visit experience. In other words, parents were less likely to say they were going to vaccinate, but they were more satisfied. So can we find a happy medium here? Um, I got hope when Doug said in the discussion of that paper, pursuing vaccine recommendations may temper the negative effects that participatory initiation formats have on acceptance without any concomitant, concomitant negative effects on parental experience. So maybe we can have our cake and eat it too. So this is our hope. Along the way, as this research has been evolving, we've been evolving our SARA project, which is strategies and, support and resources to assist hesitant parents with vaccination. This is a primary care provider package um, that is, is focused on tailoring and targeting according to whether parents are, are accepting, hesitant or declining vaccination. Um, it has different goals different strategies and different resources for those positions. Obviously, our goal, it, our, our primary goal here is a public health goal. It's to see high vaccination uptake. But we want to see if we can have, make that happen in a way that's satisfying for parents and that addresses the needs of the very hesitant and the non-vaccinators. It's, we're trying to make it responsive to clinician needs, capable of integration, um, acknowledging the straightforwardness of the consent process, but using that guiding style for hesitancy and declination. We're putting a recommendation in every single, you know, um, script that we're setting up in this study, so that everyone is clear that that provider thinks that their child should be vaccinated. But we've found motivational interviewing to be a really appealing, useful approach, because it's about um, behaviour change communication, whereas shared decision making is more about a partnership when there's um, the evidence is not saying you should go one way or the other. So motivational interviewing certainly has promise and I look forward to hearing more about that in subsequent talks. We're doing um, the development of SARA um, as a phased project. So we've got funding for phases one and two, which are developing the intervention, doing a lot of iterative modification as we collect our qualitative data. Um, we're up to the stage where you see the gray. So we're nearly at the end of phase one and phase two is really looking at how practices use it in everyday life. Um, and seeing whether it's capable of potentially being integrated. We'd also like to trial some of our assumptions and some of our um, particular components, but they would be side projects and we're not funded to do those trials. So we've done formative interviews with providers. And this is what they've said. They find the interaction with accepting parents straightforward. They don't want to complicate things naturally. Um, they have very variable processes for agreeing consent from nothing to something that's fairly detailed and even um, starts before the visit, which is ideal. 
They, have, um, they want to avoid queuing hesitancy with people who are cautiously accepting. So they didn't want us to make a mountain, a mountain out of a molehill with that part. They, for the hesitant, they wanted better resources and time efficiency. One GP said to us, I don't need to be taught how to communicate. I know that already. I want the cheat sheets to give to parents. So we thought, OK, we'll give you what you need. But we know that some of your colleagues would like some support, even though we may not say we're doing communications training. So we thought we'd use the resources to embody the approach and the structure to this tailored targeted communication. Because for us, Sarah is about how you communicate um, more so than what you actually communicate. It's about valuing that process, the trust building and the relationship. They want time efficiency. So you can see we've got a challenge here in our intervention. With declining parents, this was the most difficult interaction. There was this roadblock. Clinicians felt like they had this major impasse. When parents didn't want to vaccinate, it challenged their professional identity in a number of different ways. And um, some of them had had such formative experiences with it early on that they'd kind of developed a bit of a script and a way to deal with this um, that involved some level of abandonment. So they're not going to change. I'll just sign their form. This is when we had exemptions. Um, and they can, you know, go off and do whatever. But they, they had just resolved that it wasn't going to work trying to do anything much with them. So it was clear that down that right hand of the spectrum, there was going to be, they, they, would, they told us they would welcome some tips and tricks and resources. We did 11 focus groups with parents who were groups of accepting parents, groups of hesitant parents, and groups of selective or delaying vaccinators. We're doing in-depth interviews with individual um, declining parents um, for various reasons. And those focus groups said what you know, you, some of you have found in your research, that the process of thinking about and deciding on vaccination begins in at least pregnancy. And parents wanted the information then. They preferred, um, in terms of screening, their level of hesitancy in the waiting room, they preferred um, an open question rather than a tick box screener. They wanted to know what to expect and how to manage reactions. They wanted control over the level of detail in the information they received. They preferred to read more about the pros if they were accepting and they wanted an option for more information about serious side effects, but not necessarily much information. We saw some danger priming happening there when we provided them with a table that, that Kath had actually helped us develop that talked about the serious rare side effects and gave them the, the parameters on them as well. But down the other end of the spectrum, they did want that information. They saw that as making it a more trustworthy resource because it wasn't afraid of, you know, kind of covering up serious side effects. And down that end of the spectrum, they were very sensitive to the sense that they were being propagandised in any way. So they wanted a lot of neutrality. And this was where we were providing them with the first draft of the resources um, to get feedback on them. So this is very formative. So this is what the structure looks like now. If you imagine clinical pathways, these are communication pathways. You start um, along that spectrum of acceptance. You start with the reminder. That is, um, if the practice has that capacity, that's an opportunity for the practice to send them to a link where they can get the basic consent resource. Um, the screening process either happens there or in the waiting room. It involves receiving the consent resource and being asked, what are your questions? Or ticking a box, I have no questions. That was what we've settled upon as the screener. Um, and that allows the clinician to decide whether they think they might be quite hesitant or they're not going to vaccinate. And often those declining parents will come in for another reason. And then it's vaccination. And the, the little toolbox represents a resource there. So the resource is one that's already in use, that's very well received, that's um, what to look out for. Then when parents are unsure or have significant questions, 
we've got resources for them, including the Q&A tools. We've put some on the table out there, um, which are focused around those, those, um, those concerns about vaccination that you saw earlier, or a, uh, a weighing up the pros and cons tool I'll show you in a moment. There's also the option to refer or defer. If this looks like it's going to blow out in time, we're looking at setting up networks with adverse events clinics who will agree to see vaccine hesitant parents as well. Or if there's an access issue, speak to them by phone. <coughs> with declining parents, um, as with the others, we have discussion tips and they're going to be most important. I'll show you that in a moment. And a what to look out for um, resource that is what we're calling the anticipatory guidance. If your child's not vaccinated, here's, here's what to look out for in terms of symptoms. Here's when to call emergency. When you call, let them know that your child's not vaccinated. So if they have a particular set of symptoms that you, you, your child might be put in another room. Um, and here's some other things to think about if you're choosing not to vaccinate uh, around um, right up to you know, receiving family assistance payments in Australia and a number of other things. So that resource is designed to build trust in those parents and keep the bridge there. Those, the Addressing Common Concerns resources, uh, there's five of them based on those common concerns and we've struck the, structured these around the rules of debiasing and debunking. We've looked at the literature, we've tried to follow the rules which say, do not rehearse the myth in the top sentence, you know, don't say, Myth, vaccines cause autism, because for some people who are immune, naive to that myth, they may start to remember just those two concepts together because the negation tag can fall off with time. So we're saying the thing that we want them to remember up front in that second sentence. And we struggled with the vaccines cause autism myth um, because if you say the thing you want people to remember, um, you end up saying having vaccines and autism in the same sentence. So we thought, well, what about autism? So that's um, those five resources. And the others we're still developing. So what you'll see here is the the resource to help weigh up the pros and cons is based on the values clarification component of decision aids. And we'd learned from a trial that Kath had done that hypothesised that that might be the thing that helps parents who are very hesitant or thinking about not vaccinating move towards vaccination. Because what it does is goes through with parents, either the provider can do that or they can take it home. The, what could happen if you choose not to vaccinate and how important those things are to them. And on the next page, what could happen if they choose to vaccinate? And we've embedded not just health impacts, but social, psychological, economic pros and cons within there. Um, and again, that's something that we need to trial, but it's the, the, the development of it is as much as possible based on evidence. The declining discussion guide is a resource for providers and it will be complemented with training. So it includes key facts about parents who decline, what can be achieved, those goals, um, what strategies can be used, and some discussion tips. The discussion tips are, mostly open questions designed to focus the conversation so it's going to be as time efficient as possible. Um, it includes moderated language and includes a recommendation, but the recommendation is halfway through after exploring why they've decided not to vaccinate. This is where we adopt motivational interviewing in particular, where we um, have a, a vignette, for example, which says, look, um, a, 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 are there any particular vaccines that you're really concerned about? Okay, are there any diseases that you're really concerned about? You know, maybe we can work out a bit of a winnable plan here. Would you consider having a tetanus containing vaccine? Because a lot of parents who don't vaccinate are still worried about tetanus um, more so than the others for some reason. So the um, goal there is to explore potential motivations for parents to move from full vaccine refusal. 
We also have um, uh, some rationale for why we're suggesting these approaches and references. We want to implement CERA first with these paper-based tools and then we'll incorporate it into a number of dig different digital pathways so that it's usable in different provider contexts. And the training uh, we'll develop is three options, a 15-minute quick introduction to the resources, two-hour training with CME points or half-day training for specialist communicators. So in summary, vaccine vaccination discussions are increasingly complex. We have a complex crowded schedule and hesitancy needs to be addressed. Primary care encounters are highly influential and clinicians find um, declination in particular really challenging. So uh, we see in the literature that vac uh, recommendation is really important for anybody and needs to happen. And Sarah applies knowledge from shared decision making and motivational interviewing to hesitancy discussions. And we hope with that that we'll make the interactions more satisfying for parents and providers, more effective and hopefully good for public health as well. And um, it is evidence formed, informed, but it needs evaluation in experimental conditions. And that's a lovely mug that Helen Bedford gave me. <laughs> Thank you.